Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Grant Cameron, and I have a, a special guest that I have an assistant. Nicole Sackage is joining me from Illinois. And Nicole and I, it was actually Nicole's idea to come up with a panel for uh, Triangle Witnesses. So th this upcoming Saturday and Sunday, we have two large panels of uh, people with uh, Triangle stories from around the world. And we had a couple of stories that were uh, sort of too big to actually give them the, the proper time on a panel where they would only get a couple of minutes. And the, the, the guest that's joining us this morning for a full broadcast is uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Lynn Katai from Arizona. So good morning, Lynn. Good morning to everyone. Yes, this yeah. is exciting. I'm so glad and that I get a chance to really um, share uh, some of the important data from what's become the most witnessed, yeah. most documented, most important mass anomalous aerial sightings in modern history, if not all of history. And coming to this, not only as a medical doctor, but as a key witness uh, to um, uh, this incredible uh, story, actually, which we're gonna share today, um, how it unfolded. But uh, coming as a scientist and trying to be as meticulous as I could with the data, coming as a physician, to let people know that they're not alone, that uh, even though most anomalies can be explained, only a small percentage cannot. Just because we don't have the technology yet to definitively define what these things are, it doesn't mean they're not real. And people need to know out there when they have an anomalous experience, it's real to them, even though it might be explainable. And to share it is cathartic, it's healing. So certainly as a physician, as an, an experiencer, up close and personal, two years before the mass sighting, two months before the mass sighting, during the mass sighting, and subsequently, I certainly know what it feels like to have a, a paranormal, uh, out of this world experience. And I happen to be the only person who has captured 35 millimeter photographs of what is now called the Phoenix Lights, which uh, is, is miraculous. I've had them analyzed and authenticated by military and university optical experts throughout the last 25 years. And they are true unknowns. They cannot be explained or denied. And certainly as an educator for over 40 years, on the reality of vital health issues. Um, I work with NBC and USA Cable and have a, a company out there, health education learning programs. When this fell in my lap, two years before the mass sighting without any interest or knowledge in this topic at all, but capturing photographs up close and personal and having an experience that was just totally incredible. And then two years later, capturing the same phenomena, same mile wide phenomena head on, turning into a V-shape, confirmed the next morning by air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport as true unknowns, and we'll get into that conversation, as well as during the mass sighting, I captured the signature video, the signature footage of that night, the only footage that has been authenticated as a true unknown, confirmed again the next morning by air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport as over a mile wide, with these lights that seem to be attached to something that turned against the wind. There is so much information and misinformation and disinformation out there that after thousands of people saw what I had been seeing on March 13th, 1997, for two years, I actually pushed my entire medical career, accomplished medical career aside to try to find a logical source and meaning for what I had witnessed and photographed, which I have yet to find. But what I ended up with seven years later was a 750 page journal of such incredibly credible data that ultimately as a scientist, as a physician, as a, an experiencer and as an educator, I couldn't just stick it in a drawer and finally came forward in 2004 to set the record straight and to share the data. The data speaks for itself. Let people decide for themselves. Beautiful. Now we're gonna, we're gonna... Is that a good five minutes? Yes, beautiful. beautiful. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I kind of. Uh, we're going to go to the, I'm getting a feedback here. Is the sound okay? Is my, can you, am I coming across okay? Yes. 
Both okay. of you are. Oh, okay. I've got a, a feedback here. Um, you, 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 you mentioned your involvement. Uh, before we go to the slides, we're going to do your slides. I got a question for you. In terms of coming forward, what was that like for you being sort of a, a doctor and your, your husband? How did you break this that, okay, I'm, I'm going forward with this? After much soul searching, seven years after the mass setting, I stayed anonymous, totally anonymous, only a handful of people and scientists and professors at university that I was consulting on my 35 millimeter photographic evidence, trying to find a logical explanation and no one could give one. And realizing that uh, after pushing my accomplished medical career aside and finding so much credible data that confirmed not only the vast history of these phenomena for centuries since human documentation began, but as the story unfolded, it was so fascinating, so interesting that um, ultimately with the data that I had on 35 millimeter and video that could not be explained or denied, um, I, I just couldn't stick it in a drawer as an educator for over 40 years on the reality of vital health issues. I felt it was imperative to share the reality of this vital issue. Beautiful. Okay, let's go to the slides here. And um, is that okay? Is that coming through okay, Nicole? Yeah, I, think I sound is. very froggy, <laughs> but it is what it is. I guess. Okay. Okay. So no, you see now that. Oh my goodness, that's all over the place. Um, I wanted to tell the story as it unfolded. That's why I gave it to you in the email the way I did, because I wanted to start two years before the mass sighting. And okay, then, we've got that, but we've got just the, the opening slides. If you, can you see the slides? Yes, the, the book. Okay. Yeah, the book. So just the, this is the book cover, right? Nobody's a, hearing us right now. We're discussing ourselves, right? No, this is this is this is going to be uh, this is going to be on the, the main presentation. No, no, oh, no. I, I mean, right now, right now, we're not being recorded. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, the Jesus. first the first five minutes I've t I'm going to take out, and then this is the part that we're going to go live. Okay. With can we start like now? Okay. Is that uh, okay? Yeah, I'll, I, mean, I'll, I don't want. Uh, I'll cut. I'll cut out the part that we're where we're not making sense here. I'll, oh, okay. I'll... Thank you. One. Okay. So this is the cover of your book. Correct. Oh yeah. This this actually is a fourth edition of the book, The Phoenix Lights, A Skeptic's Discovery That We Are Not Alone. Um, it took me seven years to really compile the 750 page journal every single day. I pushed my whole medical career aside and every day kept notes of not only the history, which I had no idea about until I found out a week after the mass sighting that this was happening worldwide and other countries are much more open to these phenomena as being other worldly as our own governor ultimately uh, would, would disclose. But um, when I first came out with the book in 2004, I squeezed the best of what I had found over seven years into 230 pages. And as the story unfolded, and it's fascinating in and of itself how the story has unfolded and evolved, um, I actually added chapters. The first book is so important. Every word is there. I squeezed the best of 750 pages to um, really relay uh, how important everything is that I put in their media reports, um, conversations I had with military, uh, as well as the history and the Native American connection. Uh, we'll get into that as well as the connection between all unexplained phenomena. That in itself took me on a new road because a number of witnesses had had near-death experiences as children that was reawakened by the Phoenix Lights mass sighting. And that blew me away because I did too. And if we have time, I'll get into that. But ultimately I have added chapters in the book as well as a documentary. This is the cover to the latest edition of the Phoenix Lights documentary, which is one of our dozen international film festival awards. We're so excited and thrilled and, and honored um, that this has been uh, really accepted not only by the uh, UFO, um, community, but also the mass media community. And um, that we keep evolving that as well and adding to the bonus features. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell is in it, as well as a 911 police operator who was on that night and got hundreds of calls, even though the, the media and government denied that for, uh, for a while. And um, that you can see from listening to the stories of the witnesses themselves. They're 
descriptions are so detailed and so heartfelt. I thought it was important to have a visual, a gentle overview. The book gets into much more detail, but the documentary itself is not only for um, ufologists and for people into the topic, but also for people who aren't. Um, everybody comes from a different background, from a different upbringing, from a different belief system. Some people can't deal with this topic. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. Everyone in their own time. But now there's the book, the documentary, and recently coming from my educational background on vital health issues, I wanted to get something into the classroom. We're still working on the curriculum. But in the meantime, I wanted to get something out there that could be used not only by children, but adults as well. Teachers who are using it in the classroom as we speak, as well as parents and grandparents to learn and to grow and to, to really know the um, not only the story of the Phoenix Lights. This is called the Phoenix Lights UFOs and Crop Circles Coloring Book, The Adventures of Sue F.O., Field Observer, and Hugh F.O., and he's a little alien. And I worked with a Disney illustrator, fabulous teachers. We had pilot programs in the classroom. I got feedback from the kids as well as um, experts in the field, a map maker who actually came to Phoenix. We're going to get into the fact that there may have been 10 different craft that people saw after a 12 year study. That was what was concluded because they were so different. Um, but we'll get we'll get into that. But he actually came to Phoenix. Uh, David came to Phoenix and um, to scale. Uh, from the descriptions and from the data that was collected. Uh, we have uh, the 10 different craft to color as well as iconic pictures. I wanted to, to share with, with um, anyone out there who was interested that there is a vast history of these phenomena as well as 80 crop circles to color. And I tried to also pick the ones that were the most complicated that really couldn't have been uh, man-made as well as a whole activity section that has word binders and crossword puzzles and um, sacred geometry. I mean, we really go from uh, childhood to adulthood and try to put everything in there in 160 pages in the color copy and 150 pages in the black and white copy so that people can enjoy it. It's a wonderful gift for the holidays, I have to tell you. Um, when I go to conferences, I can't keep them in my hand <laughs> um, as soon as people see them and the content inside. And that's sold by Amazon. They're all sold on Amazon. We're going to get into the, um, the gap uh, uh, geospatial animation project, which was a 12 year study. But I wanted to first show uh, the topography. So the people that are seeing the pictures subsequently will see that if you look on the bottom left, you can see that there's a car on the road. Okay. The lights reflect onto the road, very different from the true unknowns. Again, there's so much mis and disinformation out there. It was really uh, imperative that I share this data too, so that you can see the reality of what these objects are and then decide for yourself. On the right of that uh, car is actually skylights. If you can see the, um, the line of lights on top of that home, which is significant because, uh, and I, I don't know if I can use my, can you see this? Can you see my uh, arrow? No, no, no. no. okay. It's my screen. Um, thank you for showing that. Uh, and if you go straight up, you're going to see, no, no. If you go straight up on that picture, yeah. you can see South Mountain on the left yeah. and the Australian Mountains on the right. Right. Where they intersect. And you're going to see subsequently the pictures that I have seem to show that these phenomena keep popping up in that area. Now there's a, a little aside that I wanna share since we're looking at this picture, which I think your audience will appreciate because this is part of the whole Phoenix Lights picture. South Mountain is on the left, a few miles back is the Estrella Mountain Range. In between those mountain ranges is the Gila Bend, G-I-L-A, Gila Bend Indian Reservation. And they only have one school and invited me to present my substance abuse prevention education program six months before the mass sighting, serendipitously. There's many coincidences that I do not no longer believe in coincidence, but this was one of them where they invited me to uh, help them out. 
And six months later, we had the mass sighting and I started to notice, which your audience will notice soon, that these phenomena keep popping up right where South Mountain Indian strays intersect, very much where their um, sacred ground is. And I called the principal up and I said, did anybody happen to see strange lights on March 13th? And he started to giggle. And I said, is that funny? He said, are you kidding? We've been looking up at them for centuries. We call them sky beings light beings, sky people. Um, it's part of their culture. I had no idea. That was the first I had heard of it. And uh, on further inquiry, I not only found out and he shared with me that that's how the Estrellas got its name. It means star in Spanish, gateway to the stars. And they also believe in that area that the um, area is a gateway or portal to these other intelligences, which then I found out <laughs> Many indigenous cultures worldwide welcome these other intelligences. In fact, the Hopi Indian reservation here has protocols to invite these intelligences in. Some believe that these orbs, particularly that thousands saw on March 13th, 1997, and I saw up close and personal two years before, are actually spirit world or intelligences, ancestors coming to give them guidance and comfort and knowledge and inspiration. And I have to admit, Grant, I have been inspired to do this. I would have never, ever <laughs> chosen this topic. But for some reason, as you can tell, I'm yep. a little passionate about it. So I wanted to, to share that aspect because that's a very important aspect in all of these because the native cultures have believed not only that there's other intelligences out there visiting us and welcome them, but it's a very benevolent situation. And they also um, believe in the, in the connection between between all things, we can get into that if we have time, which is very poignant and something that the Phoenix Lights actually relayed to people during the mass sighting. Beautiful. Okay, um, if we can go back to the first picture and then I'm gonna share with you the first sighting that I had because um, again, with no interest or knowledge in this topic at all, the night before my birthday, my birthday Eve, February 6th, my birthday is February 7th, my husband was standing at one wall of our bedroom is a window and we're pretty high on the mountain. This is our view from our mountainside home, uh, which we, we get to see uh, planes coming in and out of Sky Harbor. We know what helicopters, street lights, car lights look like. And I happen to be in the other room in the bath. And again, we're nestled in the mountains and we're a gated community. So there is no way, and I underline that, underline that, that this was military. It's a no-fly zone. And here I am relaxing and my husband is standing at the window uh, that anything that pops up out there, pretty much we can see if we're in the bedroom. And um, he was on several medical and hospital boards at the time, one that doesn't get ruffled at all. And he was speaking to my mother-in-law back east, calling to wish me a happy birthday. And suddenly he yells out, Lynn, get over here quick. Get over, what the hell is that? And he never sounded excited like that. So I grab my tail, I run to the window, dripping wet. And a little below us were three amber orbs over very treacherous, again, gated community, very treacherous desert landscape. And it was like, it was so close. It was about a hundred yards away, if not closer. And it was something that just just stops you. Uh, and and you're, you're in awe because it's something you've never seen before. And coming from a video workbook rap background, I wanted to grab my video camera, but as many people out there, I'm sure that have had experiences like this will say, you don't wanna move. You don't know how long it's gonna last. So I tried to take everything in mentally, the size, the shape, the color. They were about three to six feet each. They were oval shaped, like an egg on its side. And I've, I've described that for, since it happened actually um, to very few people at the time, but what's really, ironic and amazing is when the Nimitz Air Force came forward, the Nimitz uh, pilots, to say that what they have seen were oval shaped, okay? Yep. And yeah. then what happened is similar to what they said. I mean, the color within each orb was an amber color throughout, didn't glare. 
at all. Every other light glare out there. These are very soothing, very mesmerizing. And I'm thinking to myself, if I don't get a picture of this, and, and I call them an orb because the light did not extend outside the edge, it was self-contained. And I thought if, if, if I don't get a picture, nobody's gonna believe it. And I go running to the closet to grab my 35 millimeter. My husband calls me back. He says, get over here quick. One of them is disappearing. And we both stood there in wonder. I mean, just, uh, it was just awesome to see the top orb. And it's very hard to describe when the Nimitz Air Force described these as, as a lozenge shape, which they were actually cloaking. They were like uh, mechanically as if there was an intelligence behind them started to shrink very, very slowly, like a, a dimmer switch. Again, it's, it's difficult to describe um, in, in logical terms, but to a pea size, again, mechanically, as if there's intelligence behind it. And when it disappeared, it still felt like it was there. Where did it go? To another dimension, perhaps? Yeah. I stepped out on the balcony. Now we can go to that next picture shot a picture of the two lower orbs and you can see them on the lower left hand side and immediately noticed an eerie silence as if time had stopped. It was just bizarre. And as I stood there staring at these two lower orbs, it felt like something was watching me. I have to admit that and I did not admit it to us all till after the mass sighting two years later. But going through my mind at that exact moment, I was thinking, who are you? What are you? Do you know that I'm here? I'd love to meet you. The next thing I remember, the left bottom orb, and that's the next picture, started to shrink, just like the top one did. And I quickly caught a picture of that. Now, number one, that was the only picture that turned out at the time, but it's miraculous. You have your little arrow on there um, that I caught one half disappeared and one's still there. I mean, that's amazing on a cheap Canon Instamatic camera, but nonetheless, that's what I captured. And what's amazing in, a, in and of itself, is that if you go back to the first picture that I took, which I found out I had later on when I went through the strips that I was told didn't have anything on them, but actually they did. And they were analyzed three years after this sighting in 1998 by Navy optophysicist, Dr. Bruce McAbee, very well respected in the field. And after I had sent him the first and the last picture, he came back to me and he said, you told me that sighting up close was only a couple minutes long. I said, right. He said, are you sure? I said, that's what I remember. He said, ask your husband. Interestingly, as I mentioned, everybody reacts differently. My husband was inside. I was outside. He did not want to talk about the close sighting at all. In fact, he just got a little agitated and I didn't talk about it. And I told him this and he said, well, you have to confirm that it was that time. And I just sat him down. I said, look, we don't have to talk about the sighting, the closed sighting, but what do you remember it lasting? He says, I don't know, two, three, four minutes long. I go back to Dr. Maccabee. And this is another little aside, but I thought your, your viewers would be interested in this because I really haven't gotten that, this out there big time. And I haven't shared it that much as well. It took me over a dozen years to share it in the uh, second edition of the book. But he said to me, first of all, the same exact phenomena as you will see in a little bit that I caught head on turning into a V and also video that the night of the mass sighting, but caught the same thing two months before the mass sighting is in the same location disappearing where that big arrow is as I'm capturing the close objects. The close objects, I was so concentrated on, I didn't even notice those, but he did. He noticed not only that they were in the same location, again, you can see the skylights on the bottom. It's the same location where South Mountain and the Estrellas intersect. Go to the next picture and you can see that the same phenomena, now there are two of them, okay? Yeah. So then he says to me, look at the skyline. He says, it's, it's very interesting that the same phenomena was there in 95 that you also captured in 97, but go back to the first picture. And he says to me, look at the skyline. I said, okay. He said, and I would have never ever noticed this data. He says, there are many groups of lights on in the first picture 
groups of lights, not just individual lights that are off. And if you go to the second picture that are off in the second picture. Yeah. And he says, that doesn't happen in a couple of minutes. He said, I'd like you to do an experiment for me. He was very meticulous in his investigation. He said, go out onto the balcony, try to stand where you were standing in 95 and take a picture of the skyline one night every hour, the next night every half hour. And I actually did it another night every 15 minutes to find out when these groups of lights start going out. And I did. And he said to me, can I present this case in the upcoming 1999 MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, which I had never heard of before, International Symposium in Washington, DC. This is 1999. I said, hey, I said, Dr. McAbee, this is your baby. I would have never realized this data. I wouldn't even have realized that the same phenomena were in the background in the distance uh, as I would capture in 97 just please leave my name out of it. I really do want to stay anonymous. And he was so kind to do so as were a handful of other people. And he presented the case in 1999 and his full um, uh, report is on the Phoenix Lights Network website, thephoenixlights.net. If anybody wants to look at his 21 page report and it's also um, a snippet of it is in my book. Uh, now um, in the fourth edition, but he presented it in 1999 at the MUFON International Symposium in Washington, D.C. as the first and as far as we know, the only authenticated photographic evidence of missing time. Wow. So I share that with you now. Now, wait a minute. Don't go on. Don't go on. <laughs> Don't be a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> OK, for two years did not see anything remotely like these lights, close or far. And, you know, like I said, being in our bedroom, one of our walls is a, is a giant window. So whatever pops out up out there, whether it's a smoke from a fire or planes coming in and out of Sky Harbor or a haboob, a, a dust storm we get to see, didn't see anything even close to these lights, close or far. Until Two months before the man sighting, January 22nd, 1997, I'm lying in bed and I see three amber orbs, giant balls of light in an equidistant line formation. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, wait a minute, they're in a line formation now, equidistant from each other, they're amber, they're huge balls of light. And as I watched, each one shrunk from right to left. And I actually mentioned to my husband and then he joked about it. Do I still have to go to work tomorrow? Um, he just didn't want anything to do with these phenomena. But the next night he was at a medical board meeting and I noticed the same three lights in a row are now in front of South Mountain, which is directly behind the airport. And I knew they were in front of South Mountain because there's red blinking lights on the top of the mountain to alert aircraft coming into the air, airport. And I thought, okay, enough, I'm getting video of this. And I run outside, I got about 18 seconds worth, the battery goes dead and it was charged. I run in, I plug it in, I go out, they're gone. This is about eight o'clock. Now this is two months before the mass sighting, January 23rd. My husband comes up the drive about 8.30. I go outside, I said, honey, remember I told you about the three giant orbs in a line formation, equidistant from each other last night, well, about a half an hour ago, they were right in front of South Mountain. As I'm pointing like this, they reappear in the same spot. And it was like, whoa, <laughs> I gotta get a picture of this. And that again is another coincidence because on video, it doesn't do the lights justice. They're much smaller, they're white, they flicker, but in 35 millimeter, they're in the negative. Again, they cannot be denied. So I run outside with my 35 millimeter as I'm ready to shoot the three. Suddenly six pop on, massive span over the three. Now you can show the next picture if you would. And you can see that it's wavy because I was shaking. <laughs> I have to tell you, not having an explanation for the close sighting in 95, I was thinking it was so massive that it, it, it just popping into my head, oh my goodness, this is a mothership or, or a fleet. I mean, it was unnerving, but I kept clicking away. The second picture is really important. If we can do that, yes, thank you. Because this one, again, two months before the mass sighting, 
shows unequivocally the top formation is like a V, okay? And it looks like there's two underneath. Two months later, thousands of people that saw these phenomena right above their heads would describe the anomalies as mile wide and larger, which we'll get into, five lights in a V formation with two trailing. Now this is two months before the mass sighting. And I continue taking pictures. Next one, then you can see that the, there's one orb on the bottom now, as the three orbs were disappearing on the bottom, the top formation was turning, okay? And you can see that it was turning so that the biggest um, ball in the middle there is now on the right, it's the second one, exactly. Now the next picture is very poignant because this picture has been analyzed and what was um, speculated uh, was that we're seeing these orbs and these were described by people. Some people described actual craft, which we'll get to, but other people described, including Sky Harbor International Airport controllers, as these lights seemed to be attached to something or had a force field in between. And if you look at the bigger lights, we're postulating that that was the closer arm and the two lights in between is a further away arm. If you can see that, that there, exactly. That's the biggest, yeah. bigger, closer arm. And then the two lights in between are a further away arm. Was there a force field holding them in, in rock solid formation? That's only a speculation, but I put that out there. Well, we can leave this picture for now because what happened the next morning, I did not sleep well that night. And I woke up thinking, come on, there's gotta be a logical explanation for this. And the night before, no, please don't <laughs> just keep on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Cause that's a whole nother story. Um, anyway, uh, the next morning, because the night before I have to share that as the three were disappearing underneath, I ran in and called the Arizona Republic air uh, newspaper and said, you gotta get somebody out there quick. There's strange lights in front of South mountain get somebody to take a picture and tell me what it is. By the time I finished my sentence, they were gone. The first thing I did the next morning was call the Arizona Republic. And I asked if anybody called to report strange lights in front of South Mountain. The operator got off, she got right back on. She said, nope, nobody called. Well, I know I called. So I said, look, I said, we did see something strange. I even got it on film. I, I, I don't know who to call. What do you suggest? She says, well, sometimes, they do experimental maneuvers from Luke Air Force Base. Why don't you give them a call, which I did. And I tried to be very professional. My husband and I are both physicians. Um, we live mountainside in Paradise Valley and we saw some strange lights at a distance near the airport. Um, do you know what they might've been? From the get-go, she had an attitude. And she said, well, they didn't come in to Luke Air Force and they didn't come out from here. So we had nothing to do with them. I said, be that as it may, we did see something really strange and it was huge and I did get pictures of it. She said, well, um, you said it was near the airport. Uh, maybe they saw something there. Now it was a mission. <laughs> so I called the FAA and I, I tried to be professional again and, and the operator was really kind. And she said, let me see if there were any air traffic controllers who saw something last night. She kept me hanging forever. She got back on. She said, well, actually there was a group of air traffic controllers here last night and a couple of them are here this morning that did see strange lights appear right over class B restricted airspace. And it was like, whoa, I said, can I speak to one of them? And uh, it took forever to get him on the phone. He was a really low key guy. I met him subsequently and he gets on the phone. He was more excited than me, if you can believe that. Um, did you see the six light where you put this in from each other hovering in information last night at 8.30? I said, yes. And he said, I can't believe you called because we saw three at eight o'clock. And then at 8.30, six popped up. And he said it was very concerning because, and he was very forthcoming initially, these phenomena popped up over class B restricted airspace. Now, there's a 30 mile radius around the center of the airport. Anyone that comes into that airspace, particularly a thousand feet altitude that these were, must call into the tower and no one did. So they immediately looked on radar, did not show up on radar, both the eight o'clock and the 830. They took up their high powered binoculars to look 
And in their own words, they describe six points of light totally equidistant from each other, massive span over a mile wide that seemed to be attached to something, but they couldn't quite see what these lights were attached to. And one of them was a meteorologist and said the entire thing turned as a unit against the wind. That's very poignant and important data as well. Then elevated slowly as a unit and then moved in synchrony behind South Mountain. So I said, so what was it? And then there was silence. And then one of them says, beats me. I said, you're air traffic control. You're supposed to know what's in our airspace. They ruled out every conventional aircraft, balloons, Chinese lanterns, flares, as well as uh, skydivers with, with lights, every conventional possibility they ruled out to them. They were true unknowns. And we kept in contact continued photographing these phenomena up until including March 13th, 1997, when thousands of people were outside looking up at the sky purposely for a view of the Hale-Bopp comet, which was very visible in the Northwest sky that night, when they also caught a glimpse of these mile and Peter Davenport from the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, a couple years ago after analyzing hundreds, if not thousands of drawings and so forth from people that had contacted him about the mass sighting night, divulged that one of the objects, and we have to say there were orb formations, formations of just these lights, and there were actual craft, which I will get to, but one of them was actually eight miles wide. So we're talking wow. about massive, massive, anomalous aerial phenomena that were going at rooftop levels, gliding right over people's heads. People said about 30 miles an hour, totally silent. Some people looked up in these wells. We have a pilot, a Vietnam and commercial airline pilot who was actually right underneath one of these, what he called a canister in the documentary. And he describes inside the spinning uh, energy some people saw these orbs detach from the main object, go out into the environment, and then redock with it later. Is that what happened in 95? I leave that to the, to the viewer to decide. But nonetheless, people did see this and report it. Other people, and we're talking so silent, not a pin drop, took off at blink speed without even dispersing the air. If you go on the geospatial animation project, gap page on the Phoenix Lights Network website. And now we can get to the different craft. It was a 12 year study of thousands of reports from the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, Arizona MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, as well as um, Village Labs, which was a clearinghouse. It was a computer lab, huge computer lab in Tempe that also analyzed not only my pictures, but reports as well. and. Councilwoman Vice Mayor of Phoenix, Frances Emma Barwood, who was the only elected official who actually asked innocently, she didn't see it, but over a thousand people had contacted her to say, why isn't there investigation, which we'll get to. And she, she had reports as well in this study and two or more people had to see the same exact craft to be in the study. And if we can show some of these craft, um, they're amazing. Do you have, do you do you have anything to show, Grant? I have just the photos as you put. Well, this is this this actually is um, a picture that was taken a year after the mass sighting. We can talk about that. I'm not sure what you have next. No, we don't want to go any further. No, no, no. Go back. Go okay. back. Go back. Um, but at any rate, uh, on March 13th, just so we can um, finish this up, because there is so much myth and disinformation out there, um, I, I, it, it just seemed imperative that I come forward to set the record straight. And here is some of it. Not only were there multiple craft, and, and the study showed 10 different craft, one of the craft actually split in two and shot straight up. And, and if you look in the gap page, you'll see that they look very different. Some of them are, are very different, even um, where pilots uh, saw a disc shaped craft. But going back to this, it might have been one craft that could morph or their perspective from where the person was standing 
or a parade. And that ultimately was what the investigators decided because not only was there different objects happening at different times in different areas, and we're talking not only Arizona, we're talking New Mexico, where the, the sightings began, by the way, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, daylight sightings in Arizona. Five o'clock hour, New Mexican Native Americans reported they were seeing the same phenomena. Seven o'clock hour and t t through 11 o'clock hour in California and also over um, Nevada, uh, because let me let me tell you this story is really amazing, and I share it. Took it took the pilot uh, years to confide in me, and ultimately she said she hasn't come forward, but she said I could share it uh, in the in the book. Um, about ten o'clock, she left Phoenix with a whole crew and 140 passengers on her way to California. As they approached Las Vegas, they see this incredibly massive craft cover Las Vegas. And she called the radar tower and asked if they were pinging anything. Almost simultaneously, another commercial pilot called in and says, what the hell is this in front of me? And not only that, but a voice came on, a very authoritative voice came on the speaker and kind of freaked her out and wanted you know, everything in, in detail. And she said, whoa, whoa I think we, we must have been mistaken. We're not sure what, what, what it was and we're on our way to California. As they get close to California, about a half hour later, they're at 30,000 feet. Suddenly they see a giant flare less than a half a mile away on one side of the aircraft moments later on the opposite side, whizzing by them even closer, she said she jumped out of her seat, um, was a military plane. So you have to wonder what kind of message that was. The sightings continued. Now, of course, between eight and 10, and that's where the media picked up and said that the sighting was only a couple hours, that it was two events. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but actually, in reality, the sightings, the eight to 10 period, that's when the multitude of people were outside looking up at the sky at the Halbach Comet and also caught a glimpse of these mile to eight mile wide aerial phenomena and called the police station and look Air Force Base, which they denied, by the way, but people got the number for the National UFO Reporting Center from Luke Air Force Base, um, et cetera. And so that's when the bulk of people called in, but the sightings continued. In fact, it continued all the way to the next morning until 5.30 the next morning. The last report I got personally from a Boeing crewman who said his whole crew was coming into Sky Harbor and right over their tarmac at 5.30 a.m. was this massive craft. So we're talking about multitude of activities which the investigators ultimately decided this was a parade. This was a parade of multiple anomalies, which people don't know about. They think it was only one craft that came through Arizona. That is not the case. Yes, one craft did come through the most populated corridor of Arizona, but there was much more going on for over a dozen hours, a parade of multiple orb formations and craft formations in four different states, in Arizona, New Mexico, um, California, and Nevada. And a very wow. other interesting aside, uh, people say, well, why didn't the military do something? They were quite aware of what was going on. In fact, an alleged crewman from Luke Air Force Base, and we have the, a snippet of the recording that he made to Peter Davenport that evening at 3 a.m., very detailed, very professional, at 3 a.m. called in to say that there were warcraft from Luke Air Force Base sent to intercept and get gun camera film of one of these mile wide craft that was hovering over central Phoenix at uh, actually 7th Avenue and Indian School. And as they got close, the lights started to dim and then the craft totally disappeared freaking out one of the pilots that he said himself, he helped one of the pilots out of his craft. And then Luke was on lockdown after that. So they were very much aware early that evening that there was something extraordinary happening throughout the state of Arizona. 
And um, that that pretty much, do you have any questions about the mass sighting? No, I mean, you're, you're spelling out a lot of new material. Okay, well, because there's more. <laughs> not only, and this is really important to, to state, uh, Grant, there is not one, not one credible report to this day, 25 years later, of harm, threat, or abduction associated with the Phoenix Lights phenomena. Can't speak for other things, but I can for the Phoenix Lights phenomena. If anything, it was just the opposite. People were in awe and in wonder, or curious what this was. Um, in fact, we have in, in, people today still tell me that they, they feel blessed to have seen what they saw. And um, that we have people afterwards. I mean, the transformation, we can talk about that when we get into how it affected people uh, so profoundly that we have people today that changed their eating habits and went into the peace movement, went into the environmental movement um, that uh, changed their lives forever. So wh whoever did this, and I always say, I don't know what they were, but I know that they were. And it's time we get this topic out in the open, address it, accept it, and study it. So we can find out not only who's driving these things, but also move forward in our own evolution. So the data is out there if people care to look at it. And there's much more to the story because as the story unfolded, miraculously, there was no investigation. There was no investigation or explanation for months. People would go to the uh, governor and to the, to the mayor and, and they would say, what, something happened on March 13th? And as I mentioned earlier, Councilwoman Vice Mayor of Phoenix, Frances Barwood, happened to mention it in a, in a meeting, in a council meeting in May. And she was plastered by the media. Uh, I have to tell you that the, the ridicule and the snickering and the um, discrediting that was going on in, in those days uh, in 97 was just scary. It was really scary to come forward. I was so glad that I had stayed anonymous. Another question that people ask is why weren't there more pictures taken? Well, if you remember in 97, we had those clunky cameras, the clunky phones, cell phones um, without cameras. So, you know, some people happen to be outside trying to capture pictures of the hale Comet, but these things were so blocked out the stars. Some people said they could see the stars through them, but most said it blocked out the stars. So gun metal on the bottom. Some people even saw windows, but when they tried to take pictures of it, they turned out black. So that's why there's only a handful of video that night including my own. Now, this is important data too. Myself and Steve Blonder with a group of MUFON because um, it, it, it's, it's amazing that um, uh, people would say that there wasn't any data. There is so much data to really look at and, and digest and consider. And consider this, before 10 o'clock, now Steve Blonder was seeing these things like myself for days before. And he called MUFON up to his balcony and while they were up there on March 13th during the mass sighting, they actually captured five lights like, a, like an arrowhead. And uh, that was before 10 o'clock. My video was just three endpoints of a giant V or triangle over the city, which also uh, actually is the only one that's been authenticated as a true unknown because the air traffic controller saw it at the same time as, as I was shooting it. But they too, um, that those two were before for 10 o'clock. After 10 o'clock, there were two boomerang videos. Now, one is a little haphazard. I've never used that. But the other, the Kristen video, is rock solid. I mean, these things, these lights just seem to be attached to something. And that's the one that's been under fire for being flares. We will get to that. As the story unfolded, and again, there was no investigation, no explanation. June 18th, 1997 for whatever reason, suddenly there was a front page USA Today article that divulged our sighting for the first time, our man sighting was acknowledged outside of Arizona. And actually we didn't have social media at the time, but it went viral overnight the next morning. We were deluged by media from all over the world. And they too, once they started interviewing the witnesses there, Descriptions were so detailed and so heartfelt 
They kept asking, why isn't there an investigation? Why isn't there an explanation? Suddenly, the next morning, late morning, we get a public announcement that then Governor Fife Symington was holding a press conference that afternoon, an unscheduled press conference to divulge the culprit of the lights over Phoenix. And everybody took it seriously. And he comes marching out one of his aides with a giant alien head costume and made a mockery of the mass sighting, which was really disconcerting, especially for parents who were with children that saw <clears throat> these massive craft or whatever that were two and three moles wide and he's making a joke out of it. That kind of put a lid on things, but not for me. I started calling every military base and I have some of their comical conversations in the book. They were more interested and I never gave them details. And what I had photographed, then giving an explanation for it, they were just as curious. A month later, July 24th, I get a call from one of the heads of the Air National Guard. And she says, oh, Dr. Lynn, I think we know what those lights were back in March. And I was thrilled. I, 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 I was looking for any logical explanation. She says, do you believe that in all these months, no one ever looked at the log for missing Air National Guard, and the Maryland Air National Guard was in town sending off military illumination flares in Operation Snowbird, which I later found out meant military diversion, diversionary tactics, which they may have sent out flares, but I have to tell you, we don't have one witness to the true unknowns that describes what flares do. In the meantime, um, I said to her, well, wait a minute. When was the Maryland Air National Guard in town? She says, March 1st to the 15th. I said, were they in town in January? She says, oh no. I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely not. I said, well, <laughs> I have photographs of the same exact phenomena in the same exact location, confirmed the next morning by air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport, both times in January in the morning after the mass sighting, as appearing over class B restricted airspace at 1000 feet altitude. And she says, you never told me that. And then I said to her, well, wait a minute, and you're trying to tell me that flares, and I had educated myself to anything logical, including military illumination flares, the drift and drop on parachutes haphazardly with the wind, have huge smoke trails that are illuminated by the flare itself. In fact, that's why they're used to illuminate the area around it. Not one person described that. And I said to her, and you're trying to tell me that flares that cannot keep a formation traverse the entire state of Arizona for hours in a rock solid, equidistantly spaced, mile wide V formation. And she oh. says, uh, I have a call coming back and coming in, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm still waiting, Karen, for that call. In the meantime, three years later, it's so intriguing how this story unfolds because three years later, Councilwoman Vice Mayor Francis Barr was then running for Secretary of State on a platform to get answers for the lights over Phoenix. And she was asking for a reenactment, which was amazing because again, I'm a healthy skeptic, okay? One must be when you're a physician for anything walking through the door, but I'm a show me person. I've seen it up close and personal, show it to me again. If the military did it, well, shame on them for denying it and putting it right over people's heads, but hey, go for it. Right before the third anniversary, Again, we get a public announcement on TV, on the news, on the radio, that three Air National Guards, and believe it was New York, Michigan, and California, were coming into town to show everyone the Phoenix Lights. Well, um, we were ready for them. And it was a dire failure for them. If you go on the Phoenix Lights Network website, thephoenixlights.net, go to the news page, and again, it's packed with information, but if you scroll down uh, to the Arizona family square there, you will see exactly what they did. They tried to make a triangle, it was upside down, it fell apart immediately, it had huge smoke trails, just what flares do. To this date, the Phoenix lights have never been recreated or explained. And by the way, the flare theory was the only thing that ever was forthcoming from the military or government and never proven by the way, but 
they never addressed the craft that thousands of people saw. And again, it wasn't anything that you can just see through, although some people did see stars through the, the massive formation, but people actually saw gunmetal on the bottom. People saw these uh, canisters of light. And again, some came off the, the main object and went back on it. Other people um, saw these things split in two. I mean, we're talking about phenomena, technology, it was so advanced. Have we seen anything? And you should know, Grant, I mean, you're really into this, that comes close to these anomalous phenomena technology in 25 years? Okay. <laughs> well, let's fast forward now to 10 years after the mass sighting. It gets even more interesting because the former governor, Fife Symington, for whatever reason, right after the 10th anniversary, divulged that what he had seen during the mass sighting, he divulged that he actually saw one of the craft and that not only was it not flares as a military and awarded uh, military pilot, what he saw was otherworldly, which you would also hear other countries say, ad infinitum, um, as I did my research, that these phenomena were otherworldly. And that was a big step forward, I have to say, for an elected official to be brave enough to come forward and actually divulge that he actually saw the Phoenix Lights, even though he mocked it in, in 97. And he was saying at the time that people were panicking. No, people weren't panicking, quite the contrary. I'm sure it was the military and government that were panicking because after the USA Today article came out the next morning being deluged by media from all over the world, um, they had to come up with something. And as I mentioned earlier in video, the lights are much smaller, they're white, they flicker. Nonetheless, the formations are very compelling for someone that studies them. But when you just look at them, straight out, you might get confused with flares. So whoever came up with, with that explanation was, was brilliant, I have to say. Now fast forward again to 2017, when we have the Pentagon, um, well, we can, we can talk, we can, do you wanna talk about the pictures or do you wanna talk? Yeah, let's go, let's finish the pictures first. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, you can go back to the one before, thank you. The triangle. Is that the one? Yes. Um, this, this is pretty interesting too, because uh, a year after the mass sighting, without seeing any of um, anything that was similar to the orbs that we saw on March 13th, 1997. And again, if people go to the photo page on the Phoenix Lights Network uh, website, they can see the, the plethora, the, the unique collection I have of these uh, Phoenix Lights phenomena. And this happened a year after the mass sighting. We had such a fog, and fog is very rare in Phoenix because our humidity is usually 10. Um, but we had this fog that, that we couldn't even see past our street. And again, my husband would joke, um, they're watching, they are watching us. Um, but the that weekend, it was really like a wall of fog. And by Monday night, uh, it was clearing up a little bit. And my husband and I went out on the balcony. And uh, subsequently, I had met with the University of Arizona Optical Science Department. I really tried to do my homework as a scientist. And that with the Brooks Institute of Photography and other military and Dr. Bruce McAbee, and also the head of the optical science department at the University of Arizona was very intrigued by my, by my data. And um, he had said, if the lights come back, uh, you should get better equipment, which I should, because I was using a cheap uh, Canon Instamatic camera. But at any rate, um, I, my husband and I are out on the balcony and I see a, a very faint amber orb appear behind his head uh, in the distance. And I thought, whoa, you know, could they be back. And I called uh, Dr. Richard Powell, who's in the documentary, by the way, and uh, he worked also in Star Wars and very well respected and ended up to be the vice uh, president of research at the University of Arizona a few years later. But um, I asked him what I should get. And, and he told me and I ran out and got better camera equipment, top of the line Pentax camera and a tele lens and a star filter and all that. And um, he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, that I should communicate with him, which I did. But anyway, it just so happened that the next night, 
they came back. And I got terrific pictures of, of that as well on my new camera. And coincidentally, I had a, there was a meeting the next day at Village Labs and I kept very um, uh, scarce there um, because I, the media was there a lot. And I, again, I was staying anonymous, but I came up with, because I had my company for my vital health issues, health education learning programs that they did ask me, I was honest, I said, I'm uh, representing the couple that took the Phoenix Lights pictures from health education learning programs, and then they would go on to the next person, and that was that. Um, but at any rate, uh, we had this meeting, and I said, look, I don't know if they're really back, but I have a feeling, I just had a feeling they might come back a third night. Um, I, I saw them uh, the, the night before, and the night before that, I showed them the pictures. I said, you know what, let's have another little coincidence, the people that took video on March 13th, 1997, which happened to be north, south, east, and west positioned in their homes um, to be on the ready tonight. Well, let me tell you, it was like close encounters when the ship lands and you're da 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 it was miraculous, straight lines, mirror images. I mean, 40, 40 miles apart, a 20 minute array that was just unbelievable. And we're all capturing it from north, south, east and west. The finale was this giant pyramid of three lights. And again, that's in the same location where South Mountain and the Estrellas intersect. And now I had video from four different north, south, east, and west that I could actually send to Dr. Bruce McAbee. That's why I contacted him actually and sent my pictures from 95 as an afterthought. Um, but interestingly, on March 13th, when anybody says that they were triangulated, it was impossible. In fact, I had um, hired a geology professor to come out to our homes to try to triangulate where this phenomenon was. And he went to the Kristen house. And again, he shot the, the giant boomerang after 10 o'clock. And he comes to my house and I show him my footage of the three endpoints of a, of a massive V or triangle object. And he said, when did you shoot that? I said, before 10 o'clock. So he said, whoa, wait a minute. He said, let's call uh, you know, Steve Blonder and find out when that was done. He said, we're talking about not only different formations, an arrowhead and a triangle and a poo and a, and a boomerang, which by the way, that's what people described. These formations, there were, and you can see on the gap page, the spatial animation project page, that there were V formations, triangle formations, um, boomerang formations uh, that people were seeing, thousands of people were seeing then as well. But at any rate, getting back to, to, to this, um, you know, I, I, I said, uh, it, it, now we had these four videos that we could triangulate. And he said, no, they cannot be triangulated on March 13th because they were taken at different times and they're different formations. So I was excited that, that Dr. Bruce McAbee could try, you know, try to um, triangulate them uh, a couple years later. So this was in 98 and the finale of that. Now, the, the other pictures, one of my favorite pictures, which I believe is next, um, that uh, as a story unfolded, um, and again, I, I was talking about, uh, we'll get to 2017, but if you want me to hone in on this, yeah. uh, this picture is one of my favorite pictures of all time because um, this happened one month after 9-11. Uh, hadn't seen anything since 98. And I'm lying in bed and just, I mean, it was really scary. Our son was in law school at UCLA in LA. He didn't know what was gonna happen next. They were just coming out with the anthrax. And I was really in panic mode, I have to tell you. Even though Dr. Gary Schwartz down at the University of Arizona Consciousness Study Department, um, who actually wrote uh, the introduction to my book and had advised me to go out on my balcony and try to bring these things in. To me, that's a cir circus act. Um, I'm very uh, scientific when they do show up and try to be as meticulous as I can, but I did not go there. But here I was lying in bed, just um, looking out the, the picture window and thinking, where are you? Why haven't you shown yourself? Um, do you know what's happening down here? Can you help? Uh, what, what can we do? And suddenly disappeared. Okay. 
Now call it a coincidence, but I ran outside and I got a picture of it. And um, I also have a, another picture, uh, which I do not have here, um, of this thing turning, which I just found recently. So um, these were objects. And if you go on the Phoenix Lights Network website photo page, you'll see a picture of 1960 disc shape that uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, uh, we had a actually an anthropology uh, museum at the Arizona State University that showed some of the best pictures and uh, Wendell Stevens had a collection and he had a collection that included the 1960 picture of a uh, of three discs which are almost identical <laughs> daytime this that are almost identical to this. So I welcome pe people to go to the to the photo page and, and take a peek, peek at that. Do we have any more pictures available or what's next? Ah, um, the same thing and a year later um, when our, our son who's a neurologist and he was the only one that read the 750 page journal, uh, he had a heart of gold and I really trusted his opinion and it was just a mishmash of, of everything looked at me after he read it and he said, mom, you have to share this. Um, it, it, the, the data is just too important not to share and everything you've done has led up to this because I've been involved in communication for 40 years and, and um, you know, out of the mouth of babes and he happened to be home, he had a test uh, the next day and um, studying and he, uh, he, he, we were watching on the news, uh, actually they, they came up with a, um, there was a crop circle that had formed uh, in uh, the UK and they were showing the, the crop circle and, and he was saying, oh, I wish I could see the Phoenix Lights. I wish I could see the Phoenix Lights. And as I'm looking outside, I'm thinking to myself, wow, wouldn't it be cool if, if you showed up, not just one or two, but if there's three of you, um, what could that be? No, go back, go back, go back. Um, and, uh, and with a beat, there they were. And I have to tell you, they were so excited. <laughs> Um, and my, it was my husband and, and Dan ran outside and they were, Dan was trying to do his differential diagnosis and, and couldn't figure it out. Um, so that showed up then, call it a coincidence. And again, it's in the same location as uh, two months before the mass sighting and uh, March 13th. Could there be a portal or gateway there? The following year, don't show it yet. The following year, please. Um, Dan was home again. He was down at school, at medical school at the, uh, in Tucson. Um, and uh, excuse me for one second. Okay, will we be able to edit that out? <laughs> Okay, good. I'm so sorry. I no problem. That. Okay. Um, should I start with this one again? Yeah. Um, do you want these? I mean, this isn't really the story, but. Yeah, I'm, I was just taking the photos in the order that you'd given to me on that uh, page, this email you sent me. Okay. So if this is not that important, let's go to the next one. Well, I mean, that that's important for the fact that it popped up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the following year, Dan was here for a test the next day, and our prized German Shepherd had to be put down that morning, and it was really a, a very emotional night for us, and he came up about 11 o'clock at night, and um, my husband was already asleep, and we went out on the balcony, and we're hugging each other, and, um, you know, we, we were just really distraught, to be honest with you, and, and suddenly Dan says, Mom, look at that. You can go to the next picture. And there were three points of light, like a giant V. And he whispers in my ear, mom, they're here to comfort you. And I always get filled up with that because why did they show up? It was 11 o'clock at night. There they are. Again, call it a coincidence. Um, I've also been able, I collect sunsets. And um, in two different sunsets, a month apart, and I did not see this while I was taking the sunset. But when I got five rolls of pictures from the holidays back from November and December, I was going through them and I thought, whoa, what is that? And you can show the next one if you would. Oh, no. oh. And again, I, I collect sunsets and this was not, I, I could not see this when it happened, but I'm, I'm looking, what is that? And as we enlarge it, and this has been analyzed and authenticated as well, I mean, there is a rod shaped giant 
rod shaped object with with kind of like some kind of protrusion out of <laughs> out of the sides. One month later, I'm looking through the, the uh, negatives and the pictures and here are the same exact phenomena because you can see there's two little things out the out the sides there shows up in the same place. And I did not see this when I was taking the pictures, but they're there. So, you know, I've, I've come to the realization that whether these things are, are interstellar, interstellar, probably interdimensional, okay, just as I described earlier with the orbs that seem to cloak right in front of me. And, and I have to admit, not only did they seem to, to be there after we didn't see them anymore, but they seemed to be there for about three weeks after the, the close sighting. Um, but here we have a November and December 2000 uh, pictures that, um, whoa, I mean, there's, there's something there that is massive. Now, whether it's a cigar or um, a rod shaped mothership, which is possible because there are people and Native Americans have shared with me as others on Superstition Mountain and up in the Navajo Nation. There actually was a sighting the day before ours. They thought it would be big news of these orbs going around in circles and semicircles, and they all took their lawn chairs out. They're very open to these. But they've also seen these rod shaped, massive rod cigar shaped objects uh, with orbs and actual craft coming out from them over the Navajo Nation and also the Superstition Mountain Ranges. And again, if we go to the picture from one month after 9-11, I think that's coming up. Yes, sir. And um, do you have the picture of the... Um, I don't know what's coming. No, no, no I don't uh, know that, that is. Those, those are the only... Oh, no, okay. I, I haven't got the right okay. photos. So we'll have to... This one, the reason I put this one in, this is the object that I saw in 1975. Oh, this, cool. this is a time exposure. So it's pretty close. It has the same sort of coloring as the objects that you were getting. It's 1975 in Canada. Wow, cool. And Very that's cool. It's, it's turning on an angle. It's a, an right. object, uh, sort of a plasma type object. So I just I just threw that in there. Um, Very cool. Well, now now we can go back to 2017 if we can, because the story even gets better. <laughs> yes, I don't have the 2016 slides. No, that's okay. No, 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 no. no can I jump story. in and ask a question real sure. quick? To um, sure. a few moments ago, I think you you were talking about um, the three days in a row of sightings, and you said you had a feeling that they were going to come back on the third day. And right. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that feeling, because many experiencers can often sense when they're going to have a sighting, or they talk about you know getting that feeling. So I didn't know <clears> if it was more than just intuition, or if there was maybe anxiety that comes along with that or something that you could describe? Well, I can get, get off on a whole nother tangent <laughs> here because um, as I mentioned, there has not been one report of harm, threat or abduction associated with the Phoenix Lights phenomena. I can't mm -hmm. speak for other things, but I can for the Phoenix Lights, quite the contrary. In fact, in our documentary, we get into the um, whole th Hollywood and media threat, 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 and harm, 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 mm -hmm. that um, it, it, it's so instilled in us that uh, even Dr. Gary Schwartz, who is the head of the Conscious Study Department at the University of Arizona, mentions in the documentary that if you're so inundated with this thought, how do you think you're going to feel when you see something massive uh, in front of you? In fact, um, the, the movie Independence Day uh, was real popular for the six months before the mass sighting. And children, and this is really interesting, children were usually the ones to see this massive V formation of lights coming towards them and jumping up and down, Independence Day, Independence Day. But as it got close, a calmness came over everyone, adults and children alike, a connectedness to the phenomena that once it passed, mm -hmm. they felt they, they had to run after it. They asked their parents to get in the car and chase it. I mean, it's just amazing when you look at the data. And not only that, not only that, um, people have told me time and time again, I mean, they were changed by the Phoenix Lights mass sighting. They were enlightened, they were in, awakened. And what was even more poignant is there were a number of witnesses that had shared with me that they had had near-death experiences as children that was reawakened by the mass sighting. And I really, I, 
I mean, I, I was very struck by that because I did too. And I get into my near-death experience at eight years old in detail in the book. We won't have time today. But could it have been a um, foundation for what has happened now? Because, uh, and I just started admitting this, that not only did I come away from my near-death experience um, with knowledge far beyond my years, but I did meet three glowing giant beings with hoods above their heads during my near-death experience that I have felt have been with me since I was eight years old, have been my guides. I don't hear voices, but I get feelings mm -hmm. for things, strong feelings that I trust. I have come to trust, including the Phoenix Lights. I mean, it, when people read the book, they're gonna mm -hmm. see after the mass sighting, for the month after, there were some real heavy duty paranormal things that happened. And I didn't know why I had what I had. And, and when I asked my friends, I don't wanna do this. This is not a topic I, I have any knowledge about, nor do I wanna go there with the discrediting and all that. And they would say to me, Lynn, you've been doing this for 40 years. Um, you know what to do with this data. And I, I still was so apprehensive. I went out on the balcony, I looked up at the sky which I do when I communicate with these other phenomena, these other intelligences, when I, when I meditate. And, um, uh, and I, I actually have 10 ways to connect with these other intelligences in the, in the book. But I, I literally went out on the balcony and just looked up at the sky and, and meditated and said, if, uh, if I'm really supposed to do something productive and, and, uh, uh, and, and credible with this, just show me the way, I surrender. And I have to admit that I, I have surrendered to, to doing this. Whenever I get strong feelings to do something, I go with it. And I and it usually takes me to a good place. It, it always has since I was a, a child. And if you look at my bio, another little aside before we get into the connection, because I wanna, wanna do that for a minute, but um, another little coincidence, call it. Uh, I don't know if, if people have seen, and if you look at my bio, you'll see before I went to medical school, I was in professional musical theater on Broadway. I toured with Gordon McCray. In Oklahoma and Betty Grable and Guys and Dolls and understudied Barbara Eden. Uh, I drew wow. Jeannie and, and Sound of Music yeah. and a whole host of other things. But I also played the mother, Florence, Arizona, in Raising Arizona with Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter and John Goodman and uh, uh, you know McDormand, uh, Francis McDormand. What a, what a cast! Um, but what was really ironic is that once I came forward in 2004, someone had come up to me after the meeting and said, you know, there's a reference to your character and UFOs in Raising Arizona. And I hadn't watched it since the late eighties because it came out in 87. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, go take a look. Well, if you look at the movie um, and anybody that hasn't seen it yet, it's a black comedy by the Coen brothers, 20, 20th century mega hit um, where uh, the Arizona family have quintuplets and Holly Hunter and, and um, Nicholas Cage can conceive. So they kidnap one of the kids. After they do that, there's a, there's a press conference in front of our home. And one of the reporters sticks a microphone in my husband's face and says, there's a rumor that your son has been abducted by UFOs. Is there any truth to that? And my husband says, oh, please, son, please don't print that. If his mama reads that, she'll lose all hope. Now, first of all, that is the total opposite from my take because, uh, again, there hasn't been one report of harm, threat, or abduction. It was quite a benevolent sighting and has touched people to the, to the core, which we'll, we'll discuss in a sec. But um, there's no other reference to UFOs in the entire movie. And this was 10 years before the Arizona mass sighting in 97. What makes it even more poignant is that the cinematographer who went on to do big when Harry met Sally and um, the uh, how the West was won and Adam's family also created and directed the Men in Black series, which oh, opened yeah. in 1997, nice. the same year as the Phoenix Light. So coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, getting back to getting back to um, the near death experience because this is really cool data that is part of the Phoenix Lights. Really important part of the Phoenix Lights mass sighting. Because people ask me all the time, what, what, what were they here for? And not only were they here to wake us up to their presence in a very gentle and non-threatening way, but they were always also here to wake each individual, one person at a time, to 
the positive potential that we have, to the um, spiritual beings that we the are. In fact, what happened was that once people were telling me that they also had near-death experiences as children, I started researching that really intriguing aspect of the Phoenix Lights and found again, a plethora of credible data. At university level, the Omega Project is like four inches thick by Dr. Kenneth Ring at University of Connecticut, Dr. Bruce Grayson at University of Kansas, Dr. John Mack was actually writing a book about this before he met his untimely demise um, from Harvard. And um, what I found, and I lay it out very simply in the book, is it not only are the connections between all unexplained phenomena, whether it's near-death experience, out-of-body experience, unexplained aerial phenomena that have a mystical light along with the experience. The experience itself is very similar. It's amazing when you really lay it all out there, but the most profound and poignant aspect is the after effect, the positive awakening, the enlightenment, the, um, connectedness that one feels to the universe, to the earth, to each other, that may have never felt that before. And I've had more Phoenix Lights witnesses tell me of this positive transformation. I, I actually started calling all unexplained phenomena UP and up because it is an up. Not only is it an up in that you're awakened to the possibility that we're not alone in the universe, that there's so much more out there. And of course we know now with the Hubble and the Kepler and the Spitzer telescopes that there are billions, billions of other galaxies along with ours, each with their billions and trillions of stars and that have their own planets around them. And when a star bursts, it sends organic materials. We know now that the ingredients of life, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, organic materials, carbon are out there that we're made of stardust, okay? Mm -hmm. And that panspermia spreads this stardust all throughout the universe. And our solar system, our one Milky Way solar system is a very young solar system, it's only 14 billion years old. Our, so, um, our, our Milky Way galaxy, our solar system is about 6 billion years old. So there are scientists now postulating that there could be intelligent sentient entities out there billions of years ahead of us, billions of years ahead of us. So when people ask about the Phoenix Lights mass sighting, again, there is so much more to this story than has been out there. And I, I welcome people to look at the website. It's, it's packed with information to explore and to uh, consider uh, not only the home page, the photo page, the gap page, the news page, the share page. And I, I also, as a physician, urge people to contact me either through the website or through Phoenix Lights Network Facebook page, because just sharing with one person is healing. It's cathartic. Right. It really, uh, if, you, if you keep it inside, even if it can be explained, it's real to you, it festers and that's not healthy. So it's really important that we, we give that aspect. And of course, the book and the, and the documentary and the graphic novel activities coloring book. Uh, now it's the holidays. It's the perfect time to, to um, uh, purchase. The, they're all available on Amazon.com. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch the documentary for free. I've really tried to get as much out there uh, for free that I can so people can just explore and uh, consider and learn and to grow. Wonderful. Beautiful. Um, so I didn't have the 2007. Can you see the the your website on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you go to, um, with, do you want to play? I was going to do, I was going to play. I don't know if you wanted to play um, first uh, Governor Fife Symington coming forward or do you want to do Kurt Russell? Okay, I'll, I'll play those two for you. Hang on. I've got to go back to the presentation then. Because um, I wanted to, wanted to share the Kurt Russell thing. Okay, um, so here we go. This is Simon first. Um, yeah, if you, I don't know if you want to show that after I talk about Symington. I think you've mentioned you mentioned yeah, him. Yeah, I I'll, mentioned him. I'll play it and then you can you can you can go with it. Do you want me to mention it again, and then uh, you can play it? Do you want me to do it again, like lead in? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. I'm just going to make sure I've got the. Oh, shoot. Damn it. Why is this uh, resume session? Resume. Oh, shoot. <clears throat> um, no, I can't even play the slideshow. Having lots of technical troubles today. See, here it is, but it's not going to play. Okay, here. Uh, okay, okay, explain it, and then I'll see if I can play <clears throat> it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, right after the 10th anniversary of the historic, now historic and still unexplained Arizona mass sighting, it was very interesting that our former, oh shoot, I'm sorry, can I start again? Yeah. Okay. Right before the 10th, okay, I'm sorry. Right after the 10th anniversary of the now historic and still unexplained Arizona mass sighting of March 13th, 1997, our former governor, Arizona Governor Fife Symington, bravely disclosed, came forward to say that he actually saw, he witnessed one of these mile wide craft. And in his opinion, as an awarded military pilot, it definitely wasn't conventional, it wasn't flares, but it was otherworldly, which you would also hear from countries all over the world that are more open to these phenomena as being reality, that they were otherworldly. And here's one of his uh, interviews that he did for CNN for your audience. See, I've only got the part. <laughs> Fife Symington is now a businessman. Oh, shoot. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay. Sorry about this. Fife Symington is now a businessman. He was the Republican governor of Arizona for six years, elected when the first George Bush was president. Now, a decade after leaving the state house, he takes me to a Phoenix park and discloses something unlike anything uttered by any other high-level U.S. politician. If you, if you had been here 10 years ago and standing out here and looking up there at the, uh, at the lights, you, um, you would have been astounded. You would have been amazed. Governor Symington is referring to what is now known as the Phoenix Lights, an object videotaped by many and seen by thousands over several nights in the Arizona sky in 1997. Major sighting here. It was described by witnesses as larger than a football field and silent. It was a giant V, all right? And the right side of the V went over us. The left side was like a couple blocks over it. I just didn't know what to do. You know, it was just like, my God, how big is this thing? The great state of Arizona, Fife Simon. The former governor, a Vietnam Air Force veteran, had never publicly acknowledged seeing it until now. And I suspect that uh, unless... Uh, uh, the Defense Department proves us otherwise that it was probably uh, some form of an alien spacecraft. So why didn't he say anything then? Partly, he says, because he didn't want people to panic. I think as a public figure, you have to be very careful about what you say because uh, people can have pretty uh, emotional reactions. And, and, uh, and I said my goal wasn't to try to stir the pot. And he went to humorous and controversial lengths not to stir the pot. He held a news conference after the Phoenix Lights to announce the mystery of its solved. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. Don't get him too close to me, please. In the alien costume, the governor's chief of staff. Well, this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> UFO enthusiasts were not amused, especially since the governor was believed to have seen nothing. But now he's coming out. The lights were really brilliant. Uh, and it was just fascinating. I mean, it was it was enormous. It just felt otherworldly. You know, you're, in your gut, you could just tell it was otherworldly. Symington will be talking about this in an updated film about UFOs called Out of the Blue. He has also talked with an organization that wants UFO information more out of the open. 
it's very significant that someone of the stature of a governor would come out and say that they acknowledge that they experienced uh, a UFO um, because it brings a lot of credibility and strength to the case. Governor Simonton says he did tell his family, friends, and staff about what he saw early on. I still, behind the scenes, uh, tried to investigate it, but I got nowhere. So what were the Phoenix Lights? Well, frankly, we don't know. What we do know is that it's as much of a mystery today as it was a decade ago. Gary Tuckman, CNN, Phoenix. Did you ever talk to Symington? I tried. <laughs> I actually tried. Um, I got him the book and the documentary uh, through his son, actually, but I never heard a word. And I just wanted to thank him. Um, he's a... Uh, uh, he really tries to stay behind the scenes, but I, I would love to thank him for coming forward because it was a, a big move forward and uh, it still is an incredible mystery. But I, I have to tell you, it's really important, not only when he says people were panicking, I'm sure it was the military and government that were panicking because no, no one was panicking as far as any witnesses. Um, if anything, they were elated and, and felt blessed and, and just in awe from what they had seen. Um, but more than anything, it's important to, to acknowledge that it's not a belief in these things, it's a knowing. And you can just hear from his description, um, his knowing that what he saw was uh, not from here, whatever it was, whether it was interstellar, uh, interdimensional, time travelers, whatever. Um, it's, it's a knowing that, that something is out of our reality cube. And was, there any, was there any other famous people that that viewed it? And how many how many was the total witnesses? Because I've heard various figures. What, what was the estimate of the number of witnesses? I have to say, in the yeah. night of the Phoenix Lights. Yeah, I have to say that um, every year since I came forward, since actually the premiere of our internationally award-winning documentary in 2005 at the Scottsdale Harkin Shea Theater, it's been sold out every year. And it's it's one of the um, only uh, just regular people are there. Just um, uh, there's, a, there's a number of UFO uh, aficionados that come each year, but a small number because most of the audience is just mainstream, which is amazing, uh, whether they're curious or they saw it. And every year I ask, and I have to tell you, just from my own uh, data alone, there were between 10 and 20,000 20, people that, that saw the mass sighting. I, I, every year, there's more and more people that contact me now. Even pilots and military are contacting me that are retiring and telling their side of the story. So um, the story continues to evolve. And one of those stories that evolved in 2017, we know that uh, the there was a, a uh, New York Times article about the Pentagon uh, study uh, funded by the $22 million funded study of military and pilots uh, that was uh, connected with Harry Reid and uh, the Nimitz um, pilots have now come forward, um, which again, it blows me away because their description of what they saw is very similar to what my husband and I saw right outside our bedroom window. Um, but be that as it may, uh, shortly after that, which is really interesting because I mentioned that the morning after the mass sighting, I had called the air traffic controllers to confirm that what we saw and what I photographed was the same exact phenomena in the same exact location as two months before, as we know now two years before, but at any rate, they confirmed that it was the same exact phenomena over class B restricted airspace and that a couple of pilots had called in. One commercial pilot who was actually uh, departing said, what the hell are these lights over me? And a private pilot called in, it was about a half mile out uh, to report this V-shaped formation of six lights which is exactly what I was seeing and photographing at the same time during the mass sighting. And I actually mention the pilots in the first edition of the book in 2004. I didn't know who they were, but I mentioned that because I thought it was very credible that they too were confirming that these phenomena were over class B restricted airspace. And lo and behold, uh, at, at 2017, the pirate pilot private pilot came forward and it was actor Kurt Russell. And uh, his admission is really poignant and, and really exciting. And his UK interview, um, we can show I, you. Let me, yeah, let me see if I can play it. I'm having lots of trouble here, but let me see if I can play it. I'm able to help me. 
this may be, yeah. who knows? Because this is an international story. Because of you both being here, I looked into the international files, not covered by our Ministry of Defense, but maybe covered by yours. This took place in Arizona. An unidentified pilot, according to the press cuttings, flying near an airport in Arizona with his son when he spotted six lights in the night sky. So he called from the airplane to air traffic control to say, I'm seeing these lights here. I wasn't expecting any other planes. There are none supposed to be on my landing path. Can you tell me what's going on? They said, there are no other planes. He said, I'm seeing six bright lights coming towards me. Mystery unresolved. Except I'll tail number for that plane was Bonanza 2 Tango Sierra and I was the pilot. No, no way. Oliver and I should say that in the yeah. briefing. Take Oliver and I, I should have yeah. read to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oliver and I were, were flying and I was flying him to go see his girlfriend. And uh, we were on approach. And uh, I saw six lights over the airport in absolute uniform in a V shape. And I and Oliver said to me, I, I was just looking at him, I was coming in, we're maybe a half a mile out. Oliver said, Huh. Do you, what is what are those lights? And I and I then it kind of like came out of my <clears throat> reverie and and I said I don't know what they are. I said uh, he said are we okay here? And I said yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna call him and I reported it. And they said we're not painting anything. We don't show anything. I said well okay I'm I'm gonna declare it's unidentified. It's flying and it's six objects. We landed. I taxied, dropped him off, took off, went back to L.A never said a word he never said a word i never thought of it two years later goldie is watching a television show when i came home yeah. and the show is on ufos but as i'm i, I came home hey honey how's it going boom and i'm kind of hearing this t the tv going and i stopped and i started watching and it was on that event now that was the most um that was the most viewed ufo event over twenty thousand people saw that and i'm watching this and i i'm feeling like uh richard dreyfus in in uh, close <laughs> encounters of third count, it's like why why do I know this? You know what? And it's not clear to me. And finally, I said. Then they said the pilot reported it. A general aviation pilot reported it on landing. I had never thought of it since then. And I said, I, that was me. I that was me. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. I'll go to my logbooks. So I went to my logbooks, and there was the flight at that time. And I didn't mention anything about the UFO. The fascinating part of that to me is oh. that it just went literally out of my head. Yeah. And, I, and Oliver never mentioned it. And had I not seen that show, I'd have never thought of it again. Now, that to me was the weird part. Believe it out, Chris? Yes. Yes. I'm convinced. It's, 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 it's just unidentified. It's they, flying uh, and it's, it's an object. It's an object. Yeah. yeah. Right. Moving towards you at this. We need to move on. Back yeah. Job. <laughs> That's, that actually, there's another poignant point that he made that he was not alone in that. There were a number of people who saw the mass sighting and didn't say anything to anybody and didn't even remember it till months, even years later. We have a psychiatrist that was coming up from Tucson, two hours south of Phoenix, to Phoenix for a swim meet with his daughter, his wife, and a friend and he was sitting in the passenger seat. And his story is amazing. I, I actually share his letter to the Village Labs in the book because they saw this massive craft coming towards them on the highway. The, the arms of this craft extended way on the sides, on each side. And he looked out the window up at this craft. I mean, he saw this thing coming slowly over them, uh, directly above them. Nobody said a word to each other. Months later, six months or so later, they saw something on TV about it. And he said, whoa, we saw that. And they all confirmed. I mean, it's just amazing the, the different aspects. And, and there's more. I mean, we just discussed the tip of the iceberg. I do hope people will delve into the book, uh, the latest edition of the book. I recommend the ebook um, because it has colored pictures and live links so you can continue to explore. But there is so much more to this story. And, and one mm -hmm. of the main reasons I had to come forward after seven years of anonymity, and I'm so glad that I did because I've met wonderful people like yourself, Grant, and, and uh, Nicole, of course. 
Coors, who's helping us out here and um, just opened up a whole new world to me. And it's opened up a whole new world to others out there that we are not alone. We are not alone each other and we are not alone in the universe. Maybe we can just end with this. G I don't, I, I'm sorry, we, we should maybe do a little segment again and maybe put it in when I put it on my YouTube channel with the um, the actual Phoenix Light sightings or this photos that you sent to me. Can we end with this spatial, uh, geospatial animation? I've got that I can play. Maybe just explain what that's about before I play it. Okay, do you know which one it is? Um, it's, uh, I'll just I think it's the one Symington saw. <clears throat> It's downward. Yeah. This here? No, that's, that's, okay, that's, okay, okay, we could, we could do that one, and the other one is what, um, that one's great, and the other one is what Simon said, but we can show that one first. Can I, can I give a lead in? Yeah. Okay. What was wonderful is that the investigators were so dedicated and so meticulous in their analysis of the data from the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, Arizona MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, Village Labs, which was a huge computer lab who was also studying UFOs on the side um, in Tempe near Arizona State University, and Councilwoman Vice Mayor Francis Barwood, who got about a thousand uh, at least uh, reports two or more people had to see the same craft to be in the study. And miraculously, what came out of the study is there were 10 different craft. Now there were multiple things happening at multiple places over multiple times for over a dozen hours. But when you look at these craft, they're very different. Now, whether it was one craft that could morph or the perspective from where the person was standing or a parade, which ultimately is what the investigators concluded after 12 years of studying these data meticulously because there was multiple things happening. And we have an, an animation on the GAP page, Geospatial Animation uh, Project on the Phoenix Lights Network website that can illustrate a little bit uh, about these phenomena. This overview shows the ground paths of various unknown objects that traverse the skies over central Arizona and various locations throughout Phoenix between 8 and 9 o'clock p.m. on March 13, 1997. The object seen by the greatest number of witnesses over the longest period of time was described as a large V-shaped craft similar in shape to a carpenter square with wings swept back at a 60 degree angle and squared off ends. There were five large lights equally spaced underneath the object and a dome-shaped canopy on top. Tim Lee, a witness living near the Squaw Peak area, created this color illustration that was later featured on the cover of USA Today. Many witnesses described a similar object over 7th Avenue and Indian School Road, then watched it vanish as several fighter jets from Luke Air Force Base approached. After the jets passed, the object reappeared again, then proceeded toward South Mountain. This second craft did not have a dome on top and was observed at a higher altitude. Other witnesses reported seeing a boomerang or V-shaped object with a 120 degree sweep and pointed tips flying over Lake Pleasant and the west side of Phoenix at a high altitude. Airline pilots reported that the object was well above their 18,000 foot altitude. Underneath the object were six sets of lights and three lights in each set. Another mile-wide V-shaped object with a 90-degree sweep was seen descending towards the approach end of Sky Harbor Airport at an altitude of approximately 1,500 feet. A witness who observed the object less than 300 feet away reported that as it floated by in front of the moon, 
it appeared to be semi-transparent. There were four reddish amber lights along the leading edges and a red orb trailing behind the object. A fifth object was described by witnesses as a mile-wide black triangle. Some witnesses reported seeing lights in the windows, and others did not. This massive black triangle was first observed near Scottsdale and Pima Road, traveling west. Then the object turned south along Interstate 51 and flew over Squaw Peak. It is believed that this particular object was the one former Arizona Governor Five Symington reported seeing as it traveled south towards Sky Harbor Airport. Another equilateral triangle, estimated to be around 2,500 feet long, had three white lights, one on each of the tips, and one red light in the center. Witnesses first observed this triangular craft just north of the Beeline Highway, traveling southeast across Mesa, and was last seen near the intersection of Riggs Road and Power Road in Chandler. The craft then appeared to split into two identical copies that traveled away from each other in two different directions. Witnesses along Interstate 10 also reported seeing a mile-long black triangle traveling north from Casa Grande to Phoenix. The craft had three lights on the nose and one on each tip. It is not clear whether or not this particular craft is the same object that flew over Squaw Peak. There were also reports of an enormous white luminescent oval craft, estimated to be a mile long by three quarters of a mile wide, with amber lights around its perimeter. The object was last seen hovering just above the ridge of the McDowell Mountain Range, northeast of Phoenix. There was a lot going on, and that was just for an hour or two. <laughs> and we're talking much more happening uh, be from 3 30 p.m. in the afternoon, 3 p.m. in the afternoon until 5.30 the next morning. So um, there is much more to the story, and I'm, I'm so honored and grateful that you're sharing it. Well, I'm sorry I'm having all the technical problems. Let's do this last one, and then we'll um, shut it down. And I may do another interview later on to get it proper, because uh, you've got a lot of material to do, and it's very important. Let's do this, <laughs> let's do this last one, and then we'll... Uh, you can tell us uh, how people can contact you and we'll leave it at that. I have a question for you. Did you learn sure. something new today? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I did, didn't realize yeah. there was that many crap. But that's the thing. That, that's why I had to come forward. <laughs> yeah, that's... There is so much to the story that needs to be told and needs to be heard. And, um, and uh, Larry Lowe did a beautiful job with these animations and, and illustrations. Steve Lance, who did the narration, actually is my uh, collaborator on the documentary. And of course, we have Bill Hamilton and Michael Tanner, who did an incredible job compiling the data. And one of the data is actually this animation of what the former Arizona Governor Fife Symington uh, saw during the Arizona mass sighting of March 13, 1997. This is a forensic recreation of the Sky Harbor Triangle that was first reported near Carefree around 8.15 and was last reported near Sky Harbor at 8.40 p.m. The path of the craft has been pieced together by combining reports of similar objects. We begin with a view from the intersection of Lone Pine and Scottsdale Roads, two miles away from the craft as it hovers a thousand meters over Lone Pine and Pima. The craft, depicted as two miles, one tip to wingtip, proceeds east down Lone Pine Road. The view moves to the intersection of Joe Max and Tatum Roads, three miles south of the next sighting at 8.26 p.m. at the intersection of Lone Pine and Cape Creek Road. At this point, the object began a heading change and turned to the south. At 8.28 p.m., a report from a material site on the East Cave Creek Road put the craft halfway through the turn. This view is to the west from a point above Joe Max and Tatum, roughly three miles from the center of the craft. At 8.30 p.m., Max and Shala Saracen reported the craft near Crave Creek and Pinnacle Peak Roads. This report included UFO occupants seen in the windows of a triangle, which they described as at least two miles wide. At 8.35 p.m., the craft was observed from the intersection of North 32nd Street and East Shea Boulevard, proceeding south towards Squaw Peak, where it was last seen entering the Phoenix Metropolitan Valley. At 8.37 p.m., the craft was observed by Terry Mansfield and members of her hospice group on the south side of Squaw Peak. The next vantage point is the first publicly shown recreation of what then-Governor Fife Symington would have seen as the object flew over Squaw Peak. At 8.40 p.m., the craft was reported from 36th Street in East Washington, where it hovered short of the northern edge of the airport perimeter. 
The final view is a recreation of what the tower crew would have seen had they been looking due north. Some reports have this craft departing directly vertically, a truly astounding conclusion to a truly astounding series of observations. One, one last question before you uh, sort of give people your, your contact details. In the end, what do you think all these crafts and all this was all about? What, what was their main objective in doing all the flybys that they did? As I've said since the beginning, I don't know what they were. I just know that they were, and it's time we get this topic out in the open and address it, accept it, and study it so we can find out who is driving these things. But it just, the, the data speaks for itself. What these phenomena did, and, and again, it was a parade. It was a parade to wake people up, not only to their presence in a very gentle, non-threatening way, whoever was driving these. Yeah but also to wake us up to the positive potential we have as human beings, to what we're doing to our planet. I can't tell you people, and, and we go into this in detail, I mentioned some today and, and in detail in the book, how it affected people at a deep, deep soul level. They will never be the same because of the Phoenix lights. It's not a belief, it's a knowing. Beautiful. I, I, sometimes I, I lecture, I have a theory called the theory of wow where I basically say that they just want you to go, wow. Because I say, and I bring up the Phoenix Lights, I say, why, do, why does whoever it is need a craft that's that big? I mean, this is for a display for people just to realize we're not alone, something's going on, and raise consciousness. That would be accurate. And also to allay fears. Yeah. That was another main reason that I came forward after seven years of anonymity, not only to set the record straight and to do everything as a scientist and as um, a physician and as a, an experiencer myself and as an educator, but to allay those fears. Again, I can't speak for other things, but I can for the Phoenix Lights. And these phenomena, when you look at the history, and that's a whole nother story of these phenomena being here since human documentation began. Um, they're even mentioned in Sumerian writings, India writings, the Bible, Ezekiel's wheel, and so forth, pictures in the 15th and 16th centuries. The Foo Fighters of World War II were the same exact phenomena. Dr. Richard Haynes confirmed that for me, that my phenomena that I photographed up close and personal are the same phenomena that each side, Germany and Japan and, and United States thought everybody had to spy, somebody had to spy technology. And it wasn't until after the war that we found out that nobody did. These phenomena have been around for a long, long time. And certainly the Native American indigenous cultures believe that there are other intelligences and have been seeing these and documenting them petroglyphs on our mountains right here in Arizona for centuries. They've been here and they are here and they're just trying to wake us up that they are not alone. Any final questions, Nicole? No, I think we've covered it all. And yeah, I would tend to agree with Grant's theory of wow and what you're saying that it is a, a wake up call or an awakening I think the other night on SOR, I referred to it as a woo slap. <laughs> you know, it's like slaps you into this awakening where you have to figure out what it is on a personal level, not anything else, but it does, it's, it's a calling. So thank you very much for sharing with us today. This oh, absolutely, a, you bring up such a great point. Such a great point, Nicole, because I myself felt compelled. People, when, when they have a paranormal experience like this, especially with the Phoenix Lights, want to find out what it was, who's driving it. And we're still looking and it, the story is still evolving. And, and it's important, it's bringing in more and more people, the worldwide, now people are looking at similar phenomena and say, whoa, there's the Phoenix Lights. And that's pretty cool. And the more people now, again, the, the data is there. I just urge people and I welcome people to go to the website, the Phoenix Lights Network website, which is packed with information to explore and, and consider, uh, especially the home and the photo and the gap and the um, news page is, is loaded with with wonderful travel channel mm -hmm. history channel etc um as well as the share page if anybody wants to share contact me i keep I, I i take confidentiality very very seriously but if you'd like to share we have you can read people that have shared their sightings as well and then we have the book the fourth edition of the phoenix lights a skeptic's discovery that we are not alone. The first book I felt was so important, even though the publishers wanted me to write another book. No, 
No, it's important that people understand what really happened here and how the story evolved. Some of it we share today and, and the connection between all unexplained phenomena. So we've added chapters to the book and I recommend the ebook because it has mm -hmm. colored pictures and live links. It's only nine bucks, but um, it really has uh, evolved. And the fourth edition has even a picture and we didn't get a chance to get into it. Not only did I have a near death experience as a child, which a number of Phoenix Lights witnesses did and was reawakened by the Phoenix Lights mass sighting. But I also have a picture that I share for the first time in this edition, the fourth edition in the hard book and in the ebook that confirms that we do go on, that the essence of who we are does go on. We will see our loved ones again. There is much more to this story. And then of course we have the documentary, which is one of a dozen international film festival awards. We're so honored uh, to, to be able to share an overview, a gentle overview of not only the Phoenix Lights, but how it affected people, the, uh, the history a bit, uh, as well as uh, the fear factor that we're so used to from the media and Hollywood. Um, but also uh, that we have in the DVD, bonus features. Uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Edgar Mitchell shares the cover-up. Uh, he goes into that, which we don't go into in the documentary as well, as a pilot that, that confirms that it was definitely not flares, the only explanation that was ever forthcoming, which has never been proved, um, as well as uh, so much more. Uh, there, there's so much to the story, and I welcome people to, to please take a look at that. And our trilogy, our graphic novel activities coloring book, for all ages, that uh, is 150, 160 pages packed with not only Phoenix Lights data, but 80 crop circles to color and activities and um, word finders and so forth that uh, teachers are now using in the classroom, uh, as well as parents with their kids and grandparents with their grandkids. So thank you for letting me share. Keep looking up. Beautiful, uh, Lynn, Dr. Lynn Katai, thank you for coming forward and thank you for sharing with me today and hopefully uh, we can exchange some photographs and we'll do this again. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, the tape is off. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna go to our next interview.